welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Itchon. This podcast is recorded from a PRI webinar with special guest Michael Anton, a.k.a. Decius, author of Flight 93, one of the most memorable political essays of our time. He has a new full-length sequel to Flight 93, a book titled The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return. The following is a conversation with Michael Anton and PRI Senior Fellow Steve Hayward. They discuss the widening political division in America, the state of California and the left coast, and the upcoming elections. Thanks for joining us. Today we are delighted to be joined by Michael Anton, a lecturer in political philosophy at Hillsdale College, and also the author of a brand new book about what's going on at the moment called The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return. Let's start with this completely insane tweet that I'm going to hold up to the camera for people from Robert Reich, you know, former labor secretary, big celebrity on the left. And I guess the question for you, Michael, but I'll, I want to read this to um, uh, our viewers. Um, do you have your bags packed for your re-education camp assignment? Anyway, what this says is, uh, when this nightmare is over, we need a truth and reconciliation commission. It will erase Trump's lies, comfort those who have been harmed by his hatefulness, and name every official politician, executive, and media mogul whose greed and cowardice enabled this catastrophe. And I don't even know where to start with something like that, uh, beyond the presumption of truth that is a hallmark of modern progressivism. Uh, But more directly, something you write about late in your book is the spirit of revenge and retribution that's very much alive on the left these days. And here he's just laid it all out for us. So take that any way you want, but... uh, you know, my, the way I put it was, do you have your bags packed for re-education camp? But that, that's the whimsical version. Uh, this seems to me quite extraordinary. Well, I'd ask this as a question, and I'm, I'm getting, I'm, you know, bolder in the way I think about this and talk about it. I talk about it in the book, but in a kind of cautious way. And I'm starting to wonder if caution is the order of the day anymore on a question like this. But I just throw it out there back at a question to you. Why do we still live together? Ah, well, Why is the United States united when it's not united? And I think I know the answer which is that the blue coasts really, really want to rule and stick it to the red middle. And the red middle just wants the blue coasts off their back. So the blue coasts are either going to get what they want, which is a kind of permanent one party whip hand tyranny that they're cruising toward now where they can get the revenge fantasies that I talk about in the book, make turn the fantasy into reality, or they're going to, or, or they're, I think they're going to break the country. I don't, I, it's very hard to see how any kind of political reconciliation takes place now where we go back to governing, as Aristotle calls it, ruling and being ruled in turn, where each side recognizes the just claims of the other and we make compromises. I don't see that happening. I see either the blues having the power to implement their full agenda or they engender a pushback strong enough to break the country or their agenda is just so anti-natural and crazy that it all crashes in and of itself. But I don't understand why we live together anymore. And, you know, if let me put it this way, I I really do understand because it's a revenge fantasy. But if you take blue rhetoric seriously, red people are stupid, fat, lazy, opioid addicted. They can't code. They don't make anything. They're completely worthless. They're retrograde, racist, sexist, sorry, racist, maybe that's a new term, racist, (laughs) racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic. They're deplorable. Now, if I felt like that about an entire population of people, my first instinct would be run, get away from those people, separate from them in every way I can, build a big, beautiful wall to keep me away from them and them away from me. That's not the way Blue America treats the situation, though, is it? Yeah. Now, you know, it strikes me that in some ways that I know you're very familiar with on the level of political thought, this has been a long time in coming. I think of the famous remark of Adlai Stevenson back in the 50s when the woman runs up to him, you may remember, saying, all thinking people are for you. And his answer was, yes, but I need a majority. I mean, you saw that witticism, a certain contempt for a large swath of the American people. But now that has hardened in ways that you talk about in your book and have just re- uh, referred to, um, let me put it this way. The, the point of no return is your subtitle. Uh, it's, it's quite possible in my mind that Trump is reelected. I, I think it's quite, uh, it, it, about at least three times a day, I think it's likely that he'll be reelected. And what that means is the next election will be also cataclysmic with the stark choices in front of us. Uh, and so I, I don't think you can point to any particular moment when we pass the point of no return. But my question is, or my challenge, I guess, is, is uh, even if Trump wins, a large part of your argument is we've already passed the point of no return. Um, I'll well, stop. I, can, I conclude the book with a hopeful chapter. I will leave to the reader slash listener 
the assessment or judgment as to how, how likely I think the outcome that I sketch as possible is. But it is the, what, what Trump is, the promise of Trumpism is a redressing of uh, a, a generation or maybe a half century of accumulating imbalances in the economy and in society where uh, economic gains, uh, social gains, um, gains in, in honor and prestige and standing and power and everything just accrue to the blue coasts and the university towns and sap the livelihood out of the red middle who feel extremely aggrieved, left behind, forgotten, and, or even despoiled and attacked. Now, when you accumulate privilege, nobody likes to have that clawed back. Uh, we know the French aristocrats weren't saying, as, as the unrest of, and the problems of the 1780s accumulated, nobody raised their hands and said, maybe we should start paying taxes for the first time, you know, us, you know, nine centuries or however long it was. So blue America is not going to let its privileges and its accumulated capital go, not just, I'm not saying they have to give it all up, but be reduced and rebalanced easily. They're going to say, they're going to intensify their hatred of the red middle as that Trumpist program is attempted to get imp implemented. Um, so it'll be a bitter, I think, a bitter struggle uh, either way. Yeah, okay. Um, you, uh, you have a phrase, actually, I've adapted something you said. Uh, it, it, the phrase that I'm uh, working with is the cognitive dissonance of our cognitive elite. You write a lot, uh, Joel Cotkin's written a lot about our cognitive elite, and especially describes the Silicon Valley crowd. Uh, if Joe Biden wins and he gets his tax plan through, uh, Californians will face a marginal income tax rate of about 62 and a half percent. Fine with me. What's that? You asked for it. Fine with me. Oh, well, well that's, <laughs> that's one of the things that, uh, what's the old H.L. Mencken line about uh, yeah. people deserve to get it good and hard? Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if that wouldn't shake some of the cognitive dissonance of the uh, of the tech oligarchs and uh, the people who are making so much money in Silicon Valley. I wonder they have a, they have they have too many um, clever uh, and otherwise expensive ways to shield themselves from these problems. First of all, they just make too much money. So you can almost tax them at any level, and they're still going to be plutocrats beyond measure. But second of all, there's so many ways to hide assets, to shield income, to declare it as not income as this or that or the other, in ways that, you know, the accounting bills are astronomical to a normal person, but to a Silicon Valley oligarch, if, you know, I'm making this number up, but let's say you spend 1 million on accountants and lawyers to save 100 million and whatever, hey, well worth it, you know, what, but even, and even if they can't do that, I think Victor Davis Hanson has pointed this out, and I believed this for a long time too, there is still a sense that may someday perhaps erode, but among that, that elite, that California elite, that we're so rich, we can pay anything, and we'll still be the top dogs. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you know, well, anyway. Well, that's all right. I mean, well, you know, one of your early chapters is about what's happened to California, your home state, where I'm still an inmate, unfortunately. Um, there are, I think, three things to watch in this election. And I don't know if you're following this from back east where you are now or not, but there are three propositions on the ballot that test uh, left-right issues very starkly. Uh, one is the proposition to repeal Proposition 13, or a large part of it, directed at business properties. Which people some, are telling me, uh, well, okay, never mind, don't forget okay. it. Well, I was going to say, there are that'll some- That'll pass, right? There's no question that'll pass. Well, I'm not sure about that. I don't, I don't know what the polling on it is. Uh, there's a good, uh, the business community, which did not oppose income tax increases that have been on the ballot in recent years, for some of the reasons that you mentioned, they are opposing this. And some people have figured out that, oh, if you uh, raise taxes on landlords, guess who's going to pay for that? Well, renters will. I don't. We'll see about that. Um, the other two. Uh, one is there's a proposition on the ballot to repeal Prop 209, it banned affirmative right. action. Well, now this, this is the one that people who follow the state day to day more closely than I do say surprisingly they think is going to lose. Yeah, it is trailing in the polls. It's uh, there's some variation. And it looks. I would not have guessed that. I mean, that's a rare glimmer of hope for California that I don't I don't expect to see very often. Well, all right. And then the third one, which is a little bit more of a mixed bag, I suppose, from our point of view, but it's Prop 22, which would roll back California's AB5. And for anyone who's not familiar with this, who's watching, that was the bill that essentially tried to outlaw Uber and Lyft and other uh, independent contractors and and. Um, right. and but Irving Crystal used would to it outlaw them or it would basically force to treat them. They can't treat them as contractors, so they have to pay benefits. So, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, but it, it would completely upset their business model. And of course, the uh, something that's not been made an issue in this campaign is that uh, a, a prospective Biden administration or enough Democrats in Congress would like to take that rule national. Uh, and 
and this is a pro-union thing and so forth. And I don't know what the polling shows on that, but there's a vigorous ad campaign going on. But it, it strikes me that all three of those could come out the right way. And that would be interesting because you're going to have a Biden landslide in California. At the same time, we might see a substrata of opinion on issues that still shows that some sense is not entirely dead. I don't know. I, I'm going to dispute a little bit f- uh, from a center left or a Trumpist perspective, the idea that that's the, the right way, at least in the last one. Right. Is it th- is it the right outcome for us? Right. So policy wise, uh, if there's going to be uh, a revival of, of, you know, heartland conservatism, a kind of tr- uh, Trumpist, you know, coalition of economic uh, centrism, but, you know, pro worker economic centrism mixed with social conservatism. I'm not sure it's a bad thing to attack that that, that business model. It's pr- probably pretty pro worker to say, hey, you guys have got to pay benefits or you got to even if it hurts your business model. So. I don't know that that's necessarily, it, it seems like the right outcome from a traditional co- this conservative perspective because it's letting the market decide and it's saying the government is not getting involved. Yeah, let's stick with tech for a, a, a minute. Uh, just this week, the Trump Justice Department has brought an antitrust case against Google, uh, which I haven't gotten to the details of that yet. Uh, uh, but it strikes me that more broadly, there's a bit of a reckoning coming for the tech world. They have managed the feat of offending everybody um, so it's only a matter of uh, who's going to uh, smack them around. Is it going to be the right or the left or both converging in a certain way? Um, uh, what do you think? Are, are you uh, putting Well, I mean, I think it's overblown to say they've managed to offend everybody. That is to say, maybe they have, but not equally. It's very clear that tech is, is a phenomenon of the left. It's an industry of the left. It's staffed by the left and donated and so on. So that's an intra-family quarrel, whereas opposition from the right is a, is a real serious now, my own take on is that all the things I see the right, well, I shouldn't say that, all the things I see actual elected people in the right propose never seem to go far, nearly far enough to me. You know, lots of strongly worded letters and threats that maybe I'll bring you up and testify in front of my committee, but at the end of the day, who cares unless you're really taking legislative action. Um, antitrust suit, all well and good. I, I cheer it on. But really what we need to do is, as I think, one of, if not both of two things, one is simply to just break them up. I mean, these guys are, are worse than standard oil. Um, because as much as oil was the lifeblood of the economy, free speech is the lifeblood of, of our, you know, only to borrow a phrase from our, our friends on the left, our democracy, right? If we don't have free speech, we don't have democracy. We don't have the possibility of Republican government. Free thought really at a philosophical level is the most fundamental human freedom of all. And to have these companies essentially monopolize the flow of information is, is a is a disaster politically and, and I think spiritually. So I just break them up, do exactly what Teddy Roosevelt did to the big trusts, break them up. And if you, and, 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 and also um, it's very clear, they're not neutral platforms and these protections that they've lobbied for and got, they don't deserve and they don't honor and should be stripped away. They should be held to account for how they thumb the scales of news distribution, information distribution, just like any other platform and be liable to be sued, et cetera, et cetera. The so-called section 230. Right. Let's draw back and take a wider lens look at things. Um, I noticed uh, in the chapter six, you you, you uh, bring up a phrase that began on the left, has been popular on the left, but now I've noticed just in the last six months is increasingly popular with people, a lot of people on the right, and that's neoliberalism, right? Yeah. That's a, you know, that was a term of uh, a program developed um, really in the last 20 years by the socialist, really, an academic term. And although it has this difference, um, the, the left critics of neoliberalism say, well, it's not just open markets that we've never liked, but certain aspects of, uh, of the way markets have been organized to support the bankers. Uh, you know, yeah, the my understanding of the term neoliberal is like, like very much like the term neo- neoconservatism was coined by Michael Harrington as an insult, but then gets adopted by the neoconservatives who go, yeah, of course, yeah, I like it. And you know, Irving Kristol put in the most intellectual effort to define what it was, embrace it and make it into a positive thing. Neoliberal, I, I don't know who coined it, but it was the same thing. It was a it was coined as an insult by those on the, the who considered themselves the true left against those particularly Clinton administration types, the Robert Rubens. You know, it's like the Democratic Party has gotten too friendly with big business, big capital, Wall Street um, and, uh, and so on. And, you know, you know these are the, the neoliberals are, uh, are have sold us out. Now, I used the phrase I actually say um, a better term for it. Would have been um, uh, man. What actually? Oh, this is embarrassing. I forgot exactly what I said. It was something like managerial leftist libertinism or, or libertarianism, something like that. I know that's a mouthful, 
And, and it describes what, you know, it is managerialistic, it is leftist on social issues, and it's very libertarian on economics. So that, that kind of captures what we're going for. But, eh, you know, how many ever many syllables that is, it's too much, no one's going to use it. And the phrase neoliberal has been around, everybody kind of knows what it means, even though I think it's imprecise, so I'll just use that as a stand-in for what I'm talking about. Well, but my, I mean, the, the point I was uh, uh, drawing toward is that uh, you're now seeing a lot of people on the right in agreement with certain aspects of the left wing critique about this. And I think with good reason. Right. Um, I'll give you, you know, one example. As you know, I follow the energy world for my sins. And what I've noticed is a lot of the established larger fossil fuel companies are indifferent about the election. And the reason they say that is, well, yeah, maybe a Biden administration will impose a whole lot of new regulations on oil and gas production. That benefits us. It limits the competition. It will yeah. squeeze the smaller firms. We'll be able to buy up the smaller firms at a huge discount. Plus, to me, neoliberalism, I define it as essentially, um, you know, if what the Trump voter is looking for, it's the opposite of what the Trump voter is looking for. I would say what the Trump voter is looking for is a kind of economic centrism or even government activism in the economic realm and the trade realm to, to to favor their interests and to take the edge off market uncertainty, even if that means getting involved and, and you know, monkeying around inside the free market, which old conservative ideology would never countenance, combined with pretty old fashioned social conservatism. That's what the average Trump, I think that's what the average Trump voter in Ohio, Pennsylvania wants. They're not dogmatic. For them, it is not 1980. Regulation on taxes are not the number one issues. They're perfectly happy to see the government um, do, uh, you know, impose tariffs. Um, subsidize industries and do all kinds of things that an older Republican Party was comfortable doing, but that the 20th century Republican Party, at least the second half into this century, is not willing to do. Um, neoliberalism is all the opposite, you know, very, very um, um, libertarian on trade, economics, taxation, regulation, at least for favored industries. Neoliberalism is quite comfortable sticking it to non favored industries, in particular oil and gas. I and mean, that's one of the reasons why. I, I see their point, you know, well, you know, Chevron doesn't worry about what happens. They'll be, they'll, they'll be around no matter what Chevron and Exxon and Hey, to the extent that regulation crushes the competition, well, that's okay. Um, combined with extreme social libertinism. If you want to answer the question, you know, what is the matter with Kansas or, or uh, uh, conversely, what's the matter with the upper West side, right? Um, it's like they, pe these people in a sense, they do vote their cultural, preferences first and their economic preferences second is neoliberalism is, 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 is pretty good at being hypocritical and and using state power to favor its favored industries in certain ways right um and, and even to harm certain industries whereas the conservative side is just like ah you know we're, we're going to impose the same free market uh, and free trade ideology on everything the conservatives would never at least this my understanding of them and I, I don't see signs to the contrary they would never dream of like doing what cynically the Democrats will do is just looking at industries and going, okay, these are our friends and these are our enemies. So let's adopt policies that help our friends and punish our enemies. The conservatives just come out and go, no, there's one set of policies that helps business. We will, we will, um, we will uh, uh, implement all of those, even if it helps companies who, uh, who don't like us and act against us. Yeah, yeah, right. It's a, why can't we at least repeal the Hollywood tax breaks, right? <laughs> okay. uh, start there. Uh, let me, let me suggest one other thing, you know, all this talk of secession and, uh, and sorting out by demographics and so forth. Um, I thought about Canada for a moment. I, I guess the question I'm leading to is, is it, is it uh, sensible for us to think about a revival of federalism as a partial solution to our divisions? And the reason I point to Canada is that uh, Canada's had a real secession movement. You've had a referenda in Quebec that have been close. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, Canada is, enjoys more federalism than the United States. I mean, one reason, um, well, I mean, their healthcare system is, uh, uh, there's national mandates, but a lot of latitude for the provinces, and especially in energy, again, which I follow. Uh, Alberta is the Texas of Canada because their central government can't impose too many regulations on energy production there. So my point is, is um, maybe we should be talking about the idea or thinking about, you know, if California wants to ban the internal combustion engine, let them go ahead and be crazy. Uh, if Trump's reelected, they're going to put a stop to that, I think, and for sensible reasons on both law and policy. But maybe we should roll back and say, let Texas be a great energy producer. Let California be stupid. And then let's see how things fall out from I, there. I, would, I think that's a great idea if we could get, you know, what's it's impossible to imagine, though, 
what is impossible to imagine is, well, you know, let's say there were a continental, a red and a blue continental Congress. These things don't <laughs> exist, but just imagine it. And the red one is in, I don't know, Kansas, uh, <laughs> or and the blue one is in San Francisco. I mean, could they pick some neutral place to meet and say, all right, we got to turn the temperature down, fellas. And so we're going to let you have a lot of what you want, but that means you got to let us have a lot of what we want. And there's going to be no imposition in either direction. No, no, that's what, and I think the right would go for that. I don't think the left will go for that. Yeah, the left has to have centralized control, centralized power, has to have national mandates. It has to, it has to tell the deplorables what to do, and it has to have the whip hand in order to make them do it. It will not be satisfied with anything left. And I think I say this in the book, I will repeat my argument here in brief terms. I think that fundamentally boils down to two reasons. One is, as I said, leftism has become uh, a revenge plot. They think we're evil. We have it. It's very much similar to the idea of the Inquisition, right? Well, you ask yourself about the Spanish Inquisition. Why didn't people just, you know, let them, you know, it's a matter of conscience. Like, who cares? Because the people doing the mean things in the Inquisition thought they were saving your soul. Like, you deserve this. In the great moral and, and theological arc of, 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 of humanity, right? Those horrible punishments were just in the eyes of God and good for you. And if not, if even if you didn't enjoy it, necessary, has to happen, moral imperative that it has to happen. Red America must be punished, for, as Re 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 Reich says. Um, and then the second reason I think they don't want to let us go, or they don't want to let Red America go, since I don't live in Red America, although I wish I did, uh, is I think on some deep level they know they can't, that Blue America knows it can't live without Red America, or at least that it's a lot easier for Red America to live without Blue America than vice versa. A society with just... Coders, bankers, lawyers, and 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 web designers at the top, and 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 you know that, that sort of underclass at the bottom, who grows the food, who drives the trucks, who fixes the plumbing. Even California still relies to a very large degree on a whole on a big, you know, on, on hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of just sort of regular Joes and Janes, many of whom, probably most of whom, are not political. But they're definitely not woke and they're definitely not involved in a glamour industry that the state prides itself on. And they sort of know, like, I don't think we can feed ourselves without these people. Whereas it's, you know, Kansas probably says, do I need another photo sharing app designer like our company in, in downtown uh, Lawrence or, 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 or you know, w Wichita? I, you know, they just go, nah, I mean, not, you know, that's a nice to have. But food and water and, and gas and energy and, and lumber and that, that, that in the hardware store and the grocery store, those are must haves. Yeah, I do like the idea of an embargo. I mean, my thought experiment has always been imagine Whole Foods without Kansas and Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, if we could work out I, the book closes with a kind of mega solution to this problem of hyper federalism that even proposes breaking up existing states, allowing for the formation of new states, letting certain counties peel off. Um, as you know, Joel Kotkin has said, and I think this is I mean, maybe slightly overstated, but I like the quote. So he said, the worst thing to be, the worst thing to be is a red person in a blue state. I think that's about right. You are just tyrannized. Uh, and well, let them go. Let my people go. Let, the, let, let, let um, those Eastern California counties in the foothills and parts of the valley floor that just don't want to be ruled tyrannically from Sacramento, which really means ruled from San Francisco and West LA, just let them go. Let Eastern, do you think Eastern Washington is looking at, or Eastern Oregon is looking at Portland, these people in Eastern Oregon and going, wow, I love paying taxes to Salem so that Portland can consume itself, um, you know, and burn my dollars in the process. Or do you think they look east toward Idaho and say, and think, can I join your state? You know, I don't, I, or uh, West Virginia, a great example. Um, Virginia is now completely blue because it's dominated by basically five counties dominate, if I recall my numbers correctly, the other 138. Yeah. Most of which are rural gun owners, uh, very traditionalist types. And they're not thrilled with the way Richmond um, socks it to them today. And there's been a proposal. It's like, let some of these counties peel off and join West Virginia. Nothing's come of it so far, but I'm, I'm just asking, why not? Wouldn't this help our politics? I, the answer is it would, but I don't, I just, it's, it, I don't think you're going to reason the blues into saying, yeah, okay, we can do that. Now, if enough pressure or leverage is applied and it, it's clear, like, this is really the only solution that keeps the country together, then maybe. You know, I've known, anecdotal, right? I've known three or four FBI agents in my life, some of them quite recently, and extremely fine people, usually conservative Republicans, that's how I know them. 
But we've there's so much evidence now of the uh, you know, perfidious corruption inside the FBI at the highest reaches. Yeah. And, you know, some of that can be explained by old fashioned, uh, if you want to do it narrowly, public choice theory. The institution looks after itself. It has its own interest independent. Yeah, we all do. All institutions do. Well, I don't know. Uh, so uh, I'll go back to a, a point you made a little bit ago or a term you used, which is, um, I'll restate it this way. There are opportunities in opposition because there are the contradictions uh, on the left that you point out in your book and elsewhere. And all right, uh, it's a little early for this yet because we do have an election to get through. Uh, but um, two things, uh, a sort of two part question. One is, it strikes me that uh, Biden, never mind his age and his feeble mindedness, which has been around forever, he's going to have a hard time governing between interest groups that want results. They actually want an infrastructure bill. They want uh, climate legislation and the progressives who want to drive to consolidate power. You know, they're only 24 hours in a day. So if you're trying to admit Puerto Rico and D.C. as states, if you're trying to pack the Supreme Court, if you're trying to get rid of the Senate filibuster, you're not legislating. And it seems to me that there's a uh, real problems uh, for Biden to manage if it comes to all that. And then the second part of the question is, is uh, what might be the priority for opposition from our side of the street uh, in the event that we are in opposition starting in three months? Well, the um, I'll answer the first one first, because I don't have a good answer for the second one. The, 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 their coalition is inherently unstable. And it just inherently, it's basically united by the revenge fantasy. Um, so many aspects of the coalition, elements of that coalition either don't like one another and or see things through this intersectionality lens. And so the whole question for them is who ranks higher on the intersectionality totem pole? And they fight over that. No, it's me. I outrank you. I'm more of a victim than you. You're right. I, ha I, 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 you know, on this, when uh, they've redefined virtue and worth as level of present and historic victimization. And then they all want to fight over, you know, who gets to be the boss based on that. And that that's a centrifugal force that's pulling their coalition apart. Um, if I were the Republicans, I, you know, I would, I, you know, I would, <laughs> I would speed up the centrifuge, find ways to do that. Uh, that, you know, that would be politically useful. In terms of opposition though, I, I, and here I get really pessimistic. I think that once they, I think they have so much power and so many institutions that when they get back the last, piece of the puzzle and have and will then have so much control over um, you know, the amnesty and demographics and all the ways you can manipulate elections. I just don't see them ever putting themselves in a position where they could be shocked by a 2016 type outcome again. And opposition will just be talk. So uh, in that sense, opposition for us in that case will be thinking about the future, both medium and long term. I, but to the extent that it's, well, what do we do for the, about the midterm and what do we do about this and that, all that should take a backseat, it seems to me, in the medium and long term. I just don't see them allowing us to wield political power through the institutions ever again if they win this election. Yeah, well, that's a pretty stark prospect. And I don't know, maybe I'm too much of an old optimistic Reaganite to um, think that it's uh, that stark. Uh, well, we're almost to the end of our time, and I don't know, I don't usually do the prediction thing and all the rest of that, but, you know, you are a political scientist, and you've been around all this, um, and we won't hold you to this, obviously. Do you have a prediction for the election? What do you think? No. My best guess is, I mean, my best information is what people who watch the polls very carefully tell me, that there's about seven or eight states that are extremely close. Yeah. All, all of them could go to Trump, all of them could go to Biden, or it could be half of them go one way, half of them go the other, anything in between. It's all, it's like, it's like eight coin flips, essentially. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you, I don't know how you, how you make a prediction on how eight coin flips are going to turn out, especially if you only get to run the, the toss once. If, you know, the probability distribution, if we got to flip the eight coins a hundred times, we could, we could draw a probability graph, but we don't get to do that. Well, but, you know, it's funny about elections. They're usually not like a straight coin flip probability. The, the history of close elections the last 30, 40 years has been the close races tend to all flip the same way. You know, the Senate races in 1986, 1980, uh, and then, of course, the, you know, the states in 2016, they, they almost all of them flip the same way. So I don't know. Um, uh, you know, it'll be a long night, maybe a long week. We've heard all these scenarios. Um, uh, Michael, thank you for spending an hour with us, and we'll see how things go in a couple weeks, and we'll have to talk about uh, what happens then, win, lose, or draw. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. 
Thanks to our special guests, Michael Anton and Steve Hayward. If you like this episode, please tell your friends to subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to these platforms, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.